Bonjour and welcome back to our course, World History Before 1500. In the previous lecture, I explained how Homo sapiens, which is us, originated in East Africa and migrated to places like Eurasia. Along the way, they invented farming, animal husbandry, riding, which led to the birth of the first civilizations, a group of people who lived in cities and shared similar cultural traits. Today we'll cover the civilization that invented writing, the Sumerians of ancient Iraq, as well as civilizations from the same region, uh, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Phoenicians. There were other early river civilizations elsewhere in the world, like in India and China, and writing was also invented later on in other areas of the world, such as Central America and Easter Island. But we only have so much time in the class, and because civilization and writing first emerged in the Middle East, we'll stick to civilizations from that area, known as Mesopotamia. Let's pause for a second and switch from history to geography and etymology. What do I mean by Mesopotamia? The Greek root of this world will help us. Meso means in the middle. So Mesoamerica, for example, that's another term for Central America. Potamia, that comes from the word for river in Greek. Uh, think of a hippopotamus, for example. That's a horse hippo that lives in a river, Potamus. So Mesopotamia, that's the land between the rivers, which in that case would be the Tigris and the Euphrates. That region is also referred to as the Fertile Crescent. Crescent because, well, of its shape, it's like a crescent of a moon, and fertile because, well, duh, it's a comparatively humid area alongside the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, so that's where farmers could thrive. Notice something that I already mentioned in our previous lecture, early civilizations, whether it's in India, China, or the Middle East, they often blossom alongside rivers. Uh, Mesopotamia, in present-day term, that would correspond to Iraq today, and the Fertile uh, Crescent would also encompass Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, or Israel. In that comparatively small area, a surprising number of civilizations emerged between the invention of writing, 3000 BC, and the emergence of the Persian Empire uh, around 600 BC. Even when leaving aside India and China, uh, that remains a vast topic. So the purpose of this course, I will only focus on one aspect of these early civilizations that I find particularly relevant, and that's the acquisition of knowledge. So what kind of invention did they come up with? What is it that they bequeathed to us several millennia later? Uh, that will be today's general scene. So let's start with the first of these civilizations, the Sumerians, who created a flourishing network of cities in southern Iraq from roughly 3000 BC to 2000 BC. The Sumerians were very adept at building canals and developing effective systems of irrigation. This led to greater population density and so to the rise of uh, cities and social stratification. We studied this process last time. Their knowledge of metallurgy, which is how to melt metals, that was also remarkable. Melting gold uh, and silver, for example, which allowed them to make jewelry. But, you know, gold is rare, it's expensive, it's a soft metal too, so it's not exactly practical for everyday use. Far more useful would be metals that are more abundant and tougher, like copper, which could be used to make farm implements and weapons. Uh, copper, gold, silver, all these are elements that you'll find on the table of elements in their pure forms. Uh, but there are other metals that are mixtures of these basic elements, and they're called alloys. And I'm not a chemist, so I can't give you the details, but the way the elements uh, of alloys are arranged at the atomic level, that gives them some unique properties, such as toughness, which is what we're looking for here. Uh, so by 3000 BC, uh, Sumerians knew how to mix copper and tin to produce bronze, which allowed the world to move from the Stone Age, when most tools and weapons were made of stone or wood, all the way to the Bronze Age. We don't use bronze that much today, except maybe to make bells and musical instruments or for decorative purposes. Uh, but around 3000 or 2000 BC, the best tools and weapons in the world, they were made of bronze. Uh, there's another alloy, steel, which is even more useful because it combines two elements, iron and carbon, that are cheap and abundant on Earth. And steel is also far stronger than bronze when you manufacture it properly. 
the problem is that making steel is far more complicated than bronze because its melting point is way higher. And if you don't get the proportion of carbon to iron right, you get cast iron, uh, which is very brittle. Uh, but by 1200 BC, steel was commonplace enough in Mesopotamia that historians speak of the beginning of an Iron Age. Anyway, we're still uh, in the middle of the Iron Age since most of what we produce uh, is made of steel. All right, Sumerians were not just good at chemistry, but mathematics as well. Uh, some of their achievements, like figuring out the volume of a cube or the area of a triangle, that may seem simple today, but hey, you gotta start somewhere. Interestingly, they did not use a base 10 system like we do, uh, but a sexagesimal system, which is a fancy way of saying that you use a number 60 as a base for mass instead of the number 10. And that might seem odd to us because we're so used to the decimal system, uh, but 60 is a number that can be divided by a ton of numbers in mass, like 5 or 10 or 12, so it's a great base. In fact, you use the sexagesimal system every day without knowing it. Uh, when you look at your watch, for example, we divide hours into 60 minutes of 60 seconds each. Same thing when we count the degrees of an angle. If you're doing a 180 on the road, that's 3 times 60. Uh, mass was also useful for another field, uh, astronomy. And a little side note on that term. Astronomy is a science that tracks the motion of stars and tries to retrace the origins of the universe through science. Astrology, by contrast, uh, that's the kind of BS you see in magazines that claims to predict your love life based on the zodiac. Astronomy is science, astrology, that's hooey. But the difference between the two was not that defined in uh, Sumerian times, because so much about the universe remained unexplained by science, many astronomical phenomena, like eclipses and meteor showers, uh, that seemed magical. So an astronomer in ancient times might be called upon by the king to predict an eclipse of the moon and also to interpret that omen in terms of what the eclipse might reveal about the will of the gods. So he was an astrologer too. Uh, but anyway, the Sumerians' knowledge of astronomy, the science, uh, that one was very useful for timekeeping, which is another one of their inventions. Think about it, our whole calendar is based on astronomy. A day, that's how long it takes for the earth to spin around its axis once. A month, that's how long it takes for the moon to orbit the Earth. And a year, well, that's how long it takes for the Earth to orbit the sun. You can even get a rough sense of the passing of hours by using a, a sundial. Uh, so all this helped Sumerians track the passage of time, to celebrate religious festivals, for example, or to know when it was time for farmers to plant crops. Very useful. So irrigation, metallurgy, math, astronomy, a calendar, uh, well, any of these discoveries would be enough to put the Sumerians in, into the history books. But ultimately, the single most consequential of their discoveries was, you guessed it, writing. Uh, I mentioned that in the last lecture. Writing, that's what allowed us to move from prehistoric times to history, to record events and names, and eventually to accumulate knowledge. The Sumerians' writing system, which you can see here, was far different from ours. It was called cuneiform writing. Uh, that term means that their script was wedge-shaped. Sumerians wrote by pushing a stylus into clay, leaving a distinctive triangular mark. So if you messed up or if you wanted to reuse the clay, you only had to add water and erase everything. If on the other hand you wanted to record the document, you simply bake the clay and some of these clay tablets have survived 5,000 years all the way to the present, amazingly. In fact, many of them are still probably buried today. So if you're a budding archaeologist, I would suggest go to Iraq and start digging. Just be careful though, you might have to go through layers of mines along the way and IEDs because the recent history of Iraq is a bit messy. So stop for a second and ask yourself, if you were the first person in the world to invent writing, what kind of symbols would you use? You'd probably try to draw a picture of what you see, right? So if you wanted to write the word head, you would draw the head of a person, which takes time, so eventually you'd simplify the drawing until you got to a symbol, a pictograph. It's the same in Chinese and Japanese. If you look at the kanji for tree or river and sun, these clearly began as figurative drawings that were earlier simplified. 
So initially, a symbol like head in cuneiform writing was used to record basic things like, I don't know, how many heads of cattle you owed in taxes to the king. But as time went on, cuneiform writing also added symbols for verbs and abstract concepts, allowing us to record history. And that's how I got my job. A uh, little digression, if I may. Uh, if you're looking for a great word to win at Scrabble or at your local spelling bee, try a Sumerian word, ziggurat. I love that word. It's uh, the massive truncated pyramids that were built in ancient Sumeria and that was the inspiration for the Tower of Babel story in the Bible. And some of them still stand today as they've been fixed up over the years. Speaking of the Bible, many biblical stories trace their roots back to Mesopotamia since the Jews spent some time in captivity in the region, in Babylon. So there's the Tower of Babel story, as I said, but also the story of the Great Flood and Noah, uh, which was also borrowed, uh, borrowed from a story found in a Sumerian tale, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was a heroic figure, a bit like Hercules for the Greeks, or Beowulf in Nordic literature, uh, who spent a lot of time battling humans, gods, and evidently great floods. Incidentally, this would mean that the Sumerians also invented literature, in addition to writing and history. So when you think of it, a large chunk of the curriculum that you're following at your university can be traced back to Sumerians. You study literature and history because the Sumerians invented writing, Ditto for chemistry, astrophysics, math, astronomy. And if you're getting bored by the lectures and you're looking at your clock to know how many minutes are left, not in this class, of course, uh, you're using the sexagesimal system of the Sumerians. Iraq uh, was flat and wealthy, so the Sumerians often had to battle neighbors who had come to conquer them. And that's how they eventually fell to more powerful empires. Also, southern Iraq is close to the sea, so Sumerian farmers uh, suffered from increasing salinity in the soil because they kept cultivating and irrigating the same parcels of land over and over again. So the Sumerian decline was caused both by human agency, foreign conquest, and environmental forces, too much salt. Keep this in mind because we'll often encounter those two causal factors in the class. Some of history was shaped by humans, and some of it was shaped by larger currents uh, beyond our control. Let's move north now to another area less threatened by the salty Persian Gulf, the area around today's Baghdad in central Iraq. Uh, this area saw the rise of another great civilization, the Babylonians, which peaked around 1800 to 1600 BC. The Babylonians inherited and built upon the discoveries of their Sumerian predecessors, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example. But what I found most fascinating about them was their skill in administration, and that will be our scene. Because after all, if population density goes up and people move into cities, eventually you need to find a way to uh, administer your urban empire in some efficient way. Let's start with the capital. Often in ancient kingdoms, there was no state capital. Uh, it was wherever the king was. Same thing with taxation, which was, uh, that often involved taking whatever was around the temporary capital to feed the king and his entourage. Think of how much of a mess the US would be today if the capital shifted town there every time the president traveled to a different place and if the expense of running the federal government fell on that one poor city as long as the president was in town. Instead, the Babylonians created a permanent capital in, well, you guessed it, Babylon, and the king would be there, and then there would be governors to oversee minor cities and provinces uh, further away. An efficient system of taxation would also ensure that everyone paid their share, whether the king was in town or not. And incidentally, having a single capital allowed Babylon, the capital, uh, to grow to impressive proportions. Uh, the town featured some remarkable architecture. You've probably heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which ranked as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Many of these administrative changes can be traced back to one king, King Hammurabi, who lived in the 1700 BC. He gave his name to a code of laws, the Code of Hammurabi, which was carved into stone and which has survived to our present time. If you read the code today, and you can, there are plenty of translation into modern English, it may sound unjust or cruel. Uh, slavery is legal under the code. Uh, women have inferior rights. Nobles have superior rights. Uh, people can even be sentenced to be burnt alive. But having a law, however harsh, is still better than no law at all. Pause for a second and ask yourself, 
What would you do if there was no law at all? Anarchy. You'd be driving down the interstate and there would be no speed limit, which might sound like fun until a policeman stops you, uh, whether you're going 50 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour, because, well, there's no set standard. And then that policeman would be free to write you a ticket or send you to jail or burn you alive. So having set rules now sounds better, right? High-value prisoners might be kept in a jail in a few weeks uh, while awaiting the payment of a ransom. Uh, but for most people, uh, they would be punished quickly, either by a fine, enslavement, or physical punishment, because that was just cheaper. And those punishments are often designated to uh, fit the crime closely. So you would cut the lips of a slanderer, for example, or you would burn an arsonist, or you would break the leg of the person who broke yours. All that, those are in the Code of Babylon. And that's where we get the expression, an eye for an eye, or tooth for a tooth, uh, which is in the Bible, uh, but originally comes from the law uh, of Hammurabi. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested in learning more about the history of torture and punishment in prisons, I would check out Discipline and Punish, uh, which is a challenging but rewarding book by Michel Foucault, a French historian. The next civilization I want to uh, cover was located even further north in Mesopotamia, the Assyrians. They peaked from 1000 to 600 BC, so there's a lot to say yet again, uh, but yet again I will focus on just one single dimension of their civilization, and that will be war. The Assyrians introduced a number of military innovations that have survived to this day. For example, instead of selecting their army leaders based on personal connections, like the first cousin of the king gets to be a colonel, say, uh, they introduced promotion based on merit, just like in the US Army of today. Also, instead of having a big blob of an army that would attack en masse and fight a big, confusing melee, the Assyrians would break down their army into smaller units. This allowed them to have a proper chain of command and also to have tactics on a battlefield. Uh, if you have distinct units, you can ask this unit to attack on the right flank while the other attacks on the left flank or stays in the reserves, for example, and you have battleship, uh, battlefield tactics. Again, uh, pretty standard in the US Army today. One unit that was central to the Assyrian army was a chariot archer, and it combined speed, uh, some measure of protection, and then firepower, so it played the role that a tank would play on a modern battlefield today. Uh, the Assyrians were also gifted at siege warfare, things like battering rams, siege towers, sapping under enemy walls, all of which were useful tricks when most of the wealth was now concentrated inside cities and that these were fortified. So in many ways, the Assyrians were the predecessors of our modern way of war, which did not win them any popularity contest in their time. Their subjects or their enemies complained that the Assyrians were aggressive imperialists who imposed ruinous taxation on their vanquished foes. And if you complained or you resisted, they were known to displace entire populations, execute prisoners, often by brutal ways like impalement. So that's something we should always keep in mind as historians. The people who have made a mark in history are, were often those who pillaged and who conquered. Uh, nowadays, if you kill one person, you're a murderer and you're going to jail. If you kill 100,000 people, then you're a historical figure, like Julius Caesar or Genghis Khan, and you can be honored in history books. I remember once seeing a bumper sticker that said, well-behaved women rarely make history. And that's one of the ironies of the historical field. All right, let's move on to the final civilization of the day, the Phoenicians. And you'll be happy to know that they were known more for peaceful activities rather than siege warfare and impalement. The Phoenicians were not located in Mesopotamia per se, but further east along the Mediterranean Sea in what would be today Lebanon. Even though Lebanon is small today, Phoenician city-states were even smaller. Each of them included just one major port like Byblos, Tyre, Sidon, plus a bit of land around, control of the sea lanes, and whatever overseas settlement that they might have founded. So we're not talking about a big empire like the, like the Assyrians here. The Phoenicians prefer to trade rather than conquer. Their civilization peaked around 1200 to 800 BC, which would correspond to the aftermath of an event known as the Late Bronze Age Collapse, the time when around 1200 BC, many of the great civilization of the Eastern Mediterranean suddenly just collapsed. It's a mystery why this happened, but historians think that the process may have been caused by human agencies, such as war, or the environment, like a drought or volcanic eruptions, or both. 
Uh, either way, the decline of more powerful neighbors allowed the small Phoenician city-states to gain prominence in the same way that the fall of the dinosaurs led to the rise of the mammals. So what did the Phoenicians trade? Let's get some clues from etymology, the study of the origin of words, and vexillology, the study of flags. If you look at the flag of Lebanon, you'll notice how the centerpiece is a tree, the cedar tree, which was highly prized in the ancient times. Uh, the Jews spent a fortune importing cedar from Lebanon to build their temple in Jerusalem, for example. So what about the etymology of the word Phoenician? Well, that means purple in ancient Greek. So the Phoenicians were called the purple people by their trading partners. And that's because they used little sea snails to manufacture a purple dye that was exported everywhere. And that purple dye was so valuable that it was associated with imperial rule in ancient times. The emperors of Rome and Byzantium wore uh, purple clothing, for example. And even today, if you're quote-unquote born to the purple, that means that you're born of royal ancestry. And the Phoenicians also used another sea snail to produce yet another dye that was called royal blue. And the name speaks for itself. That's another luxury dye associated with aristocrats who have quote-unquote blue blood. What the Phoenicians did not produce themselves, well, then they would buy it elsewhere and import it to the Middle East, and that was yet another way to make a profit in the process. So to trade over long distances, the Phoenicians developed advanced, sturdy ships that were perfect for trading. So if you know anything about ship building, you've heard of a keel at the bottom of a boat, or a crow's nest at the top, or galleys where you row a boat, or tenons and joints uh, to tie planks of wood together, or tar, uh, which is a product of oil that keeps the hull waterproof. All of these were Phoenician inventions. Also a Phoenician invention, celestial navigations, looking at the North Star to know your way. So sailing, that means commerce, but also means exploration. And the Phoenicians just crisscrossed the whole Mediterranean from present-day Lebanon to Tunisia, Greece, and France. And they also crossed the Straits of Gibraltar into the Atlantic, exploring the coast of Western Africa 2,500 years before the Portuguese retraced their steps in the 15th century under Henry's navigator. By bringing into contact various areas of Africa, Europe, Asia, the Phoenicians played a key role uh, as disseminators of knowledge, you might say. But they did not just pass knowledge on, they also improved upon it. Uh, the writing system of the Sumerians, cuneiform, that was a great step forward, but it was also pretty cumbersome. Uh, because it was largely composed of pictographs, where one symbol represented just one word, like Chinese today, it was complex and hard to learn. So liber literacy was not widespread. And what's the point of inventing writing if most people can't use this skill anyway? So the Phoenicians invented a much simpler system, where one symbol, like A or B, represented a sound, like A, ah, B, rather than a whole word, what we call today an alphabet, after those two letters, A and B, alpha, beta in Greek. So because there are only so many sounds in the language, maybe 20 or 30, an alphabet is much simpler to learn than a writing system based on pictographs, which requires hundreds or even thousands of symbols to represent every word in our language. And the simplicity of that system helped improve literacy rates. Uh, the Phoenician alphabet influenced the Greek and the Roman alphabet, which is the one you're, you're using right now as you are taking notes, because you're taking notes, right? This stuff will be on the test. Uh, well, let's end with a nice story. Well, sad rather than nice, and probably not 100% true, because that story has been told and retold many times, so it makes its history with myths and literature. A story. Anyway, that story involves a lady from the Phoenician city-state of Tyre. Dido was her name. She was the daughter of the king of Tyre, but she was cheated out of her inheritance by her brother, and so she had to flee the city. So she ended up in North Africa, in what would be Tunisia today. And there she asked the local Berber people to give her a bit of land to create a settlement where she and her friends could find refuge. And the locals only offered her as much land as an ox hide could cover, which is to say nothing, it was a way of mocking her. Uh, but the joke was on them, because Dido was smart. She cut the hide into a tiny strip of leather, which she unfurled into a huge circle that was long enough to encompass several acres of land, enough to build a city on. And that's how the city of Cossage was founded. 
keep that name in mind because Carthage eventually turned into a powerful empire of its own, which was a major rival of Rome around 3 to 200 BC. We'll get back to that later. So the poet Virgil had more to say about Dido in the Aeneid, a poem about the Trojan War. And according to that poem, after the fall of Troy, Aeneas, a prince of Troy, ended up uh, in exile in Carthage, where, of course, he fell in love with beautiful Queen Dido. Uh, they had a bit of a fling, and then the morning after, as men are prone to do, Aeneas woke up and announced that he had better things to do elsewhere. I don't know how to say it in Greek, but it was some version of wham, bam, and thank you, man. So Aeneas boarded his ship, sailed for Rome, and left poor Dido high and dry. She was so distraught that, according to Virgil, she threw herself on a funeral pyre and killed herself. Now, I know that people often think that history is not practical and useful the way engineering or computer science might be. But you can still learn some useful moral lesson from history. Such as this one. Ladies, never kill yourself over a guy. Believe me, we ain't worth it. Well, if I'm giving out uh, dating advice, that's probably a sign that I have nothing left to say and that I should stop here. So to recap, Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescents were home to many civilizations from roughly 3000 to 500 BC. The Sumerians, who were the discoverers, the Babylonians, who were the administrators, the Assyrians, who were the warriors, and the Phoenicians, who were the traders. Next time, we will study another incredible civilization that all by itself span as much time as all the civilization that we studied today combined. And that will be the Egyptians. Goodbye and au revoir.